Welcome to the debrief, everybody. We're going to jump straight into the Robert Durst case. Now, this is the case involving that real estate heir who's accused of killing a woman who had information about the death of his own wife. We heard arguments about handwriting and selective evidence, selective editing in a film about the case. Robert Durst, of course, accused of killing Susan Berman because the state says Berman had information that could have convicted him in the killing of his wife. The key evidence an alleged confession came from the HBO series The Jinx, but the defense argues it was all edited out of context. The show's creators claim they discovered the incriminating statements in a rambling series of thoughts when Durst went to the bathroom with his microphone on during an interview. The series production company is hit the ground running. Two years after Durst's wife's disappearance in the 80s, Durst abruptly stopped working for his father's real estate company. Durst is said to have written a longtime friend, Doug Oliver, saying, some things have been bothering me. I'll be in touch. Oliver, though, apparently is not cooperating with prosecutors. Seven days is, I, I need, I mean, I, I travel a great deal, and um, I really need much more time because it sort of happens that I know in the month of February, I'm, I need to be in Singapore. I don't know the exact date, so, um, He'll work with you, but I'm giving you seven days. Your Honor, and yeah. the last thing, could you advise also the witness, um, he has requested before that the only way to come out here, quote, he will not fly commercial. We need to pay for the fuel for his private that plane. So we so have serious. informed him that the Your county Honor, does not do me. that. Can, can you please let the witness, uh, let the witness know that he's going to have to fly out here, coach like any other witness, and that we will not be paying for gas for his private plane or flying him in a different style. But you will pay airfare. We'll pay airfare. He'll get a coach. Yeah, like I really don't want to give my number. I don't trust him. I, I'll give it to you, sir. Uh, I, I'm not calling you. <laughs> I don't call witnesses. Yeah. Uh, how, about, how about this? How about I've been doing several times with this gentleman. I really don't want to be called. How, how about um? How about if you give it to one of these gentlemen here? Pointing to the defense attorney? Yeah. This is how it's been, Your Honor. Yeah. One of the key pieces of evidence in the case is a letter mailed to the Beverly Hills Police Department two days after Susan Berman, the victim, was killed. The letter said the word cadaver and also had Beverly misspelled. The defense wants to limit the state's handwriting experts who are expected to say that Durst wrote the letter. Cunningham should be strictly limited to testimony regarding the alleged similarities and lack of similarities in uh, Mr. Durst's writing and the cadaver, cadaver note. He cannot, as the court stated, opine specifically that Mr. Durst is the author. With respect to the question of whether or not um, we can raise during the trial the reports of the supervisor and the original handwriting examiner that another person actually wrote the note, the court, as well as the state, have acknowledged really how terrible job those people did and how actually it could probably border on some form of obstruction and said that they wouldn't be allowed to testify. We have asked in our supplement, Your Honor, and the court allowed us to do so, to consider allowing us to bring out the fact that another person was identified, not for the purpose of doing anything other than establishing that there were other suspects. Prosecutors fired back saying they want their experts to be able to testify and they want to be able to discredit the defense's experts. One of the problems is that Professor Denba, in essence, wants to say that handwriting and hand printing are not reliable. He wants to talk about other states that don't admit it, etc. He wants to talk about how hand printing is different than handwriting. And here's the issue. The problem is the Cal Supreme Court has rejected every one of his positions. So I want him to testify. I'll gut him like a fish. Uh, oh. the, the problem is going to be... I can't. That's sports now. The, 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 the problem is going to be... Fish, right? I just want to give real clear, real clear warning and information to counsel that if you're calling somebody who's going to attack the whole field, who's not even a, a handwriting expert themselves, then this is the cross you're going to get. The HBO film The Jinx led to the charges against Durst. That's what the prosecutor and many of the attorneys admitted in this hearing. The production company turned over its raw footage from interviews that it actually used in its series. However, 
Durst's defense team is seeking three unused interviews Durst gave for the film. The attorney for the production company behind the series says those unused interviews are protected under California's journalist shield law. The fact that uh, the prosecution and the defense don't have something mean it's not going to be part of the case. So these unknown, unnamed interviews are just a red herring. It was not the television show that led to Mr. Durst's arrest. It was the evidence that they provided to the district attorney's office that led to the, to the arrest. They let the FBI come to their office. The people were the ones who listed uh, the 54 interviews that they wanted to produce in this case. Uh, it's very unusual for journalists to do that, but they turned them all over. The defense issued their broad subpoena. We produced 1,800 pages consisting of all of the communications between Hit the Ground Running and the LADA's office prior to the arrest. They have produced a substantial amount of material, but enough is enough, Your Honor. Uh, and the information sought at this point is just a fishing expedition. Everybody else there says the film resulted in the charges except for the attorneys for the film. Well, in case you haven't seen the jinx, here's a clip of what the defense for Robert Durst is very upset about. And there it is. You're caught. You're right, of course. But you can't imagine. What's in the house? Oh, I want this. Sister. He was right. I was wrong. Attorneys Linda Kenny Bodden and Janina Tamian are with me here. So there's a lot to unpack in this. Everybody's disputing exactly what led to the charges. Is it the film? Is it the evidence? Is the evidence that came from the film? We'll talk about semantics here, Linda. But legally, yeah. we, we got to the bottom of some of what we were talking right. about yesterday. Let's go over the handwriting first. Opinion versus scientific certainty. The judge is saying ultimately that the expert can testify. It's my opinion that this defendant wrote the letter in question, but that he can't say it with scientific certainty. That seems reasonable to me. Well, except there's, the problem is that there's no science behind handwriting. There's science behind Yeah, he can't, he can't say there's, science. No, but he can't say science. But the jury's going to see him, and, and he's going to come with all the you know 50-page opinion. You heard the prosecutor. The prosecutor still believes these are scientific, where other courts have said no. And the whole idea that you need to have a handwriting person say this is not scientific or not valid is ridiculous, because all the attack on the, on the quote, forensic science in court has come from non-scientists and people like the National Academies of Sciences, groups like have said, there's a lot of non-science in this so-called science garbage that goes into courts. Janina Tamian, next time you have an uncooperative witness, do you just say, I'll fuel up your private jet to get you to come here? <laughs> That was absolutely insane to watch. And the best is, he enjoyed himself. He, I mean, every time you get a shot of the prosecutor, you see um, Doug behind him just smiling and having a good time. Okay, you know, well, I, I guess, uh, well, just pay for some kind of an airfare. We didn't get into whether it's going to be a first-class airfare or not. Let's get into this editing situation here yes. because we've got more clarity on that. Linda, we were talking about right. this yesterday. Apparently, the filmmaker said, okay, I throw my hands up. You can have the raw footage. You can't have the interviews that we didn't broadcast because they're not relevant to this at all. They're not part of the evidence. Is that reasonable uh, as it comes to an application of a shield law? 
No, I don't really think it is. I think the Shia law is being over abused. The Shia law is for newspapers, started at the time when there were newspapers and there were journalists, not for when you're trying to sell your movie and, and have a documentary like this. It's become overused, and I think this case may be ripe for limited. I hear the, the Shia shredder law. that Linda Kenny Bond is putting the First Amendment into as we speak. If uh, you don't air it, nobody can touch it. That's the Shield Law presumption, Denise. Absolutely. And we actually had this discussion earlier. It's the First Amendment. You can't play with the First Amendment. Linda's trying to shred it. I just, uh, I yeah, heard I'm, the machine worrying up. I'm trying to get that right to fair trial equal to the First Amendment. It's number one first, <laughs> and the rest of them all go down for a reason. You're not happy with me right now, Linda, are you? <laughs> I well, love well, you. Well, uh, this Tell argument her. will not You're end. You're the best host. Okay, well, at least I'm, I'm number one in, in some respect, even though <laughs> that's because the First Amendment says so. Anyway, the former president of Michigan State University will stand trial on charges she lied to police about Larry Nasser. A district judge ruled there's reason to believe Luanna Simon knew about sexual assault allegations against now convicted offender, a sex offender rather, and gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. Simon resigned as president the same day Nasser was sentenced to up to 175 years in prison. Simon is charged with two felony and two misdemeanor counts of giving false statements to investigators. Prosecutors announced the indictment of a former Boston College student for allegedly sending abusive texts to her boyfriend before he committed suicide on his graduation day. Many have noted this case has a lot of similarities to the Michelle Carter case where a Massachusetts teen was prosecuted and convicted for spurring her boyfriend's suicide. Charging In Young Yoo, 21 years old, of South Korea, with involuntary manslaughter in the suicide of her boyfriend, Alexander Ertula, 22 years old, who leapt to his death. The investigation revealed that Miss Yu used manipulative attempts and threats of self harm to control him, yet she persisted continuing to encourage him to take his own life. The indictment alleges Ms. Yu's behavior was wanton and reckless and resulted in overwhelming Mr. Ertula's will to live and that she created life-threatening conditions for him that she had a legal duty to alleviate, which we allege she failed to do. Another test for that involuntary manslaughter law in Massachusetts. Still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, a day of protest and a change in police policy in the police shooting death of a Fort Worth woman. Plus, jury selection in the retrial of the former NFL player whose original trial resulted in a partial acquittal, a partial conviction, and a hung jury on many counts. Those cases after the break. Opening statements have been pushed back in the Tennessee prosecution of Key Anthony Garrett. He's accused of killing 51-year-old Cynthia Green, his next-door neighbor, by beating her with a clothes iron and then stabbing her. Authorities say Garrett's DNA is on the iron and on broken dishes found near the victim's body. Originally, he told police he had never been inside the victim's house, but later admitted he'd been there once. More than 1,700 potential jurors are filing through a small Colorado courtroom in the case of a man accusing, accused rather, of killing his fiance around the holidays last year. Prosecutors say Patrick Frazee beat Kelsey Barreth to death with a baseball bat. Crystal Kenny is the state's key witness. She says she was having an affair with Frazee when he killed Barreth and called her, Kenny, to clean up the mess. Frazee is charged with first-degree murder, solicitation of murder, and tampering with a body. Opening statements are now scheduled for Friday. We cannot broadcast this trial or tweet from court under the judge's orders. Rallies last night in major cities across the country demanded reform after African Americans were caught in the crosshairs of police pistols. The trial of Texas police officer Amber Geiger resulted in a conviction in the death of Botham John, but just days later, another Texas police officer, Aaron Dean, shot and killed a Tatiana Jefferson. Sisters to both victims spoke with law and crime last night in New York. Tatiana Jefferson, say her name. Say her name. The loud cries of pain and demands for reform echoed off the buildings in New York's Foley Square. Signs were raised, tears were shed by the sister of a Tatiana Jefferson, shot to death by a Fort Worth, Texas police officer. She was at home making memories with my nephew and got killed in the process. Also present, the sister of Botham John, whose killer Amber Geiger was sentenced to 15 years in prison for murder. Even when the murder conviction was read, the first thought I had was, I want him back. Speaking to Law and Crime after the rally, sister Elisa Finley said Geiger's 15-year sentence was the minimum she hoped for. 
Even after the conviction, she says justice is hard to pursue. Justice in, in my eyes would be that we don't have to attend these rallies anymore and there is not another senseless victim. So that would be justice for me. Geiger's tearful testimony did not impress her. I think she opened the door, saw a black man standing there and shot him. I think with all these cases, the police officers look at the skin as a weapon. We're not dangerous just because we're black. That's the issue. The sister of recent shooting victim Tatiana Jefferson wants a murder conviction for the officer who responded to a call that Jefferson's door was open, snuck around the property, and pulled the trigger when he saw her through a window. It was a, it's an open and shut case. I'm just going to be honest with you. She wasn't, she wasn't a threat. So kill someone and there wasn't a threat that isn't that murder officer Aaron Dean immediately resigned from the force he was arrested but has not been indicted we're going to keep making sure that my sister has justice as well as that my nephew has a successful life and don't have to let this be a part of his it's going to be a part of his story but not be his only part of his story the nephew was with Jefferson when she was shot he told police that Jefferson had taken out her gun when she saw someone prowling around her property. The video released by police shows it on the floor. And police claim the nephew saw a Tatiana Jefferson as she raised her handgun and pointed it toward the window before she was shot and fell to the ground. Those gathered in New York fear the police may even be putting words in the nephew's mouth. They are trying to figure out a strategy to let that white man walk away free and clear from shooting through that window and killing our sister. You better believe it. The legal outcome will take time. For now, support from the family of one shooting victim to another. I'm here really to support um, Ashley because I know what it's like to get that phone call in the middle of the night. We had a lot of support from the community all over the world and if just by me being here can just help her in the least, um, I wanted to do that to, to show the support that you guys showed us. Attorney Cindy Kenny Baden, Janine Atamian back again. So Janine, I, I was there last night, spoke with both of those women. They're there to support one another. There's a sense of loss. There's a sense of extreme anger. People just don't trust that the process is going to come to the right legal conclusion in the upcoming case. Okay, but it did come to the right legal conclusion in um, the Amber Geiger case. So I just wish that people would wait before we're casting every police officer under the same light and saying things like uh, police officers think that our color of our skin is a weapon. Let's see what, what's going to happen with this case. Well, what's going to happen in the minds of the people there, Linda, is that if there is a conviction, it's just going to result in a light sentence because we're talking Texas where you have to prove intent but not premeditation for murder. And then the sentencing range is so wide open that it gives, what is it, 10 years all the way up to 99 or life in prison. Well, that's a huge range. So, so I think there's the sense that the punishment isn't going to fit the alleged crime, assuming there's a conviction. As, and the big words are assuming there's a conviction. I think there's a worry about that. And what they're seeing is that was, for instance, was the statement that was discussed, the eight-year-old child, was that taken properly, right? Uh, was it taken under protocol? Uh, there's the stuff that we do if you were a child abuse uh, victim, you know, without influence on, on the kid. And so what they're seeing is, is they don't trust the government. They're seeing the government already setting up a defense for the police officer, which they th see has, ha has happened in other cases. And that's what's going on. And I'm sure the prosecutor will turn around and say, look, this is a statement that was made by the eight-year-old. It potentially provides a defense of justification of some sense. Legally, what's it going to come down to? Intent, well, that might be the easy part here, but does the self-defense justification work legally? There's at least a hook for the officer to present it in court, and I assume that's the way this is going to go out. I think that this is the way it's going to go because it would be a mitigating factor in, his, in the shooting. Or may turn around and result in an acquittal, Linda. Yeah, well, in tech, but in Texas, everyone's supposed to be allowed to have guns. Black people can have guns too, and you can have guns in your house. And if you have what you think is a prowler outside, I assume you could point the gun outside. So, I mean, there's where again we have a little bit of a disagreement. Well, what we're going to come back to in this is whether the police should have announced their presence rather than just yell "hands up, hands up," and then shoot within three seconds. That's going to play into this as well. Right. Let's move on. We've got one more case to discuss tonight. The defense for Kellen Winslow II not happy about a lack of minority candidates for jury service in Winslow's retrial on sex crimes charges. The former NFL player was convicted last summer on three counts and acquitted on one count, but 
His jury was hung on nine other counts. That's why we're back again. Out of 172 jurors summoned this week, the defense says only four were African American. Of the 86 summoned last week, only one was African American. The defense called the numbers appalling and not representative of the population in that district. So we're back with our panelists once again. Janine, is this a big problem here? What do you make of the defense's claim? Well, I understand where the defense is coming from, but again, a jury is going to be made up of your peers, and that's the pool that they're picking from. So and I, I don't think that it, it precludes him from getting a fair trial. Linda. Yeah, here, but here is the problem. The prosecution exercised a, quote, cause challenge because somebody lived near the Winslows growing up or 20 years ago. And the defense said, hey, wait a second, that's, this is Batson. You, uh, we're, 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 we're objecting here because Batson that's not in the a, case that says so you, can't you can't strike somebody based on their right. race. Because that's ridiculous. There's no indication that that should be a cause. He didn't say I couldn't decide the case fairly. And that's what we're coming down to. So. As to the overall pool, though, here, I mean, when, when they, they pull from the community, one would expect that the, the big pool of jurors who were brought in, Janine, would be representative of the general demographic makeup of the people living in that area. And I, and I agree with you. I, I mean, it's, there was 172, I think, pulled in. I think there were only four that were people of color, correct? So I understand what you're saying, but I was just saying I don't think that that precludes the ability to have a fair trial. Maybe not strictly linda what's the remedy here the remedy is for the judge to say hey we're going to pull in more jurors for the defense to choose from for the issue the strikes and we'll delay this trial until we do that to try to get a more representative jury so you're saying basically okay let's let's keep the process rolling and if we have to put opening statements off until we get enough people in here to right. representatively make up the community then that's what we should do right that's exactly what the, the judge can do if they want to do it if the judge wants to do it Going back to the core facts here, we've got five accusers all stacked up. There were convictions, there was one acquittal in the first trial, but most of the charges were hung counts, Janine. We're back yet again here. What do you make of the overall prosecution tactic of basically stacking everything up and saying, look, you know, lightning doesn't strike twice, let alone five times. That's the line the prosecutor used because we have all these accusers. There's probably truth in here that this guy's a pervert and that he committed all this illegal conduct. That's the state's theory here. I think that that's what they did the first time around and I think it didn't work. It's like a Christmas tree. You put too many balls on it and it tips over and now they're making the same mistake again. And we talked about it there. They're going to bring back Jane Doe too and possibly, you know, uh, have uh, her testimony um, do something to the conviction that they've already won. We're going to watch this case as it moves forward. Thanks a lot to the panelists, and thanks for those of you watching The Debrief along with us tonight. Live trial coverage picks up tomorrow at 9 a.m. The Debrief, back at 5 o'clock Eastern here on the Law & Crime Network.